we start now the whole session of uh, Informatics Europe, the 2020 award ceremony. And uh, we have uh, each year we give two awards. Uh, first one is Best Practices in Education. And actually, this is uh, the 10th anniversary this year of this award that started in 2011, and which is an award uh, sponsored by, by Microsoft. And then we have the Minerva Informatics Equality Award. And again, this year we have a, a, a recurrence because it's the fifth anniversary for this, uh, for this award, which is sponsored by Google. And with these two awards, we, we, we try to improve uh, research and education by recognizing the outstanding initiatives in uh, education and research in, uh, in Europe. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, okay, thanks, Franciscan. So uh, now we, we, we start the, 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 the ceremony for the Best Practice in Education Award, which is uh, sponsored by Microsoft. And then, therefore, I, I give the floor to Elisabetta Di Nitto uh, from Politecnico di Milano and also from board member and executive committee member of Informatics Europe, which has been the chair of the award committee for, for this award. So. Uh, Elisabetta, the floor is yours. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm very glad to uh, be here presenting uh, this uh, Education Award, uh, which is sponsored also by Microsoft. And it is, a, let's say, a traditional uh, award that we are having at Informatics Europe. Uh, this year, uh, if you go to the next slide, please, Rita. Uh, uh, this year, the focus of uh, uh, the award is on lifelong education and talent gap in informatics. So every year we choose a specific focus and uh, uh, this was the focus for this year. Uh, here you see the award committee uh, that was composed by Ismael Garcia Varea, Gianmarco Sequel, uh, Michael Colling, uh, Monica Landoni and Gabriela Marco. Everybody uh, cooperated and, uh, and rigorously revised uh, the submission. And uh, in the end, uh, we agreed on uh, uh, one winner and one honorable mention. So we are very proud to uh, present you uh, the winner and the honorable mention. Uh, we, we are going to start uh, with the honorable mention uh, that goes uh, uh, to a Turkish uh, project. If you go to the next slide, please. Uh, and uh, this in English is called the We Code. In, uh, uh, in uh, uh, I mean, I, I, I've been trying to rehearse and uh, to learn uh, the, the right pronunciation for the Turkish name. And uh, I have to say that I'm sure that I did not succeed, but it should be something like Code Lu. Uh, your rules, which essentially means we code. So the emphasis uh, here is in uh, um, support, in helping everybody to uh, become a developer, uh, as far as I understand. And uh, uh, so we are very proud of giving this honorable mention. I, I think that uh, uh, the uh, the prize, uh, the award holder, uh, I mean the honorable mention holder, is uh, here in. Uh, uh, in the virtual room. Um, so, can you want to just very briefly say hello to everyone? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. This is Giljan from Turkey. Very good to be uh, with you today. Uh, thank you so much for the award. And Elizabeth, you pronounced it perfectly. It is <laughs> called Lyurus as well. So, thank you so much for uh, this award. Uh, it is it is very uh, great moment for us because when we started uh, Codurus uh, around three and a half years ago, our goal was to really uh, get an attention to Turkey as a talent hub in technology with so much young population and talent. So we are very proud that uh, just we get this award today. So thank you so much uh, for this organization and your great work. Thank you to you. And so now we go uh, to the uh, award uh, owners. And uh, this is a project uh, 
uh, that uh, has been uh, is a master of IT. Uh, can you please, uh, Svetlana, change the slides? Thank you. Uh, master of IT uh, in uh, um, that has been developed by a group of university in uh, Denmark. Uh, and so uh, they get the uh, award and the, in recognition of the outstanding educational initiative. So uh, I will give now the floor uh, to the to our speaker uh, who will be going to present the, the master. So uh, Bettina, you in line online? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Will you Hello. Change that, please? Hello. Before, um, before you can get started on your talk, which we are very much looking forward to, we just wanted to say a quick congratulations um, also from our side from the Informatics Europe office. We are glad uh, to present you with the award plaque for the Best Practices in Education Award, which you can see on the picture, but it exists actually physically and we will send it to you via mail after the conference. Lovely. So, yeah, congratulations. And um, yeah, I'm happy to hand over the word to you for your presentation. Just let me know whenever you want to switch to the slides. Lovely. Please switch to the first slide, then. Well, on behalf of uh, Aalborg University and Aarhus University and the University of Southern Denmark and the Coordination Committee of the Master of IT program, I would like to thank uh, the Award Committee and Microsoft for the Informatic Europe's 2020 Best Practice in Education Award. My name is Bettina Lundgaard and I'm head of the Coordinating Committee. And on my side here is my good colleague, Associate Professor Henrik Berber Christensen. Uh, next slide, please. Master in IT is an educational cooperation between three universities in Denmark, offering a lifelong learning part-time master degree program for IT professionals. The purpose of the degree program is to help closing the digital talent gap by providing a dynamic portfolio of currently 30 courses of each 15 ECTS. The Master of IT program is a part-time degree program which allows students to do their full-time work simultaneously. The content is based on the latest research, which is of crucial importance. The digital field is in a rapid and constant development. Therefore, the program ensures that the research is transformed into usable knowledge that can be used directly in the students' daily work. Next slide, please. The students, they can compose the content of their individual education based on 30 courses the program offers. Some students only attend a few courses, others around 20%, takes a whole master degree, and a few keep on studying. Actually, we have more than, uh, we have some students who have the, the record around 10 courses. For a master degree, the student choose a specialization in either software construction, organization, or interaction design and multimedia. Um, <clears throat> they can choose areas of interest among subjects, as you can see on the slide such as IT and information security, data science, digital transformation, and much more as you can see. Next slide, please. Between 2006 and up till this year, more than 1800 IT professionals from IT businesses, the public sector, the industry, the financial sector, the health sector, and the teaching community have attended one or more courses in the degree program in the field of IT teaching, IT development, IT management, IT security and IT implementation. The program is among the top three of the 90 master programs there are in Denmark with most students, together with the master in public management and the MBA. Our students mirror the IT sector. We do mostly have male students and we too have a challenge to get more women into IT. I look forward to the program tomorrow. Our students though are very experienced, which our teachers appreciate because they get some great cases for their ordinary teaching and they use students to test their research. Last slide please. <clears throat> the Master of IT program has a very high degree of satisfaction. 
among our students. Instead of quoting my last slide here, I would like to quote one of our students. He's called Michael and he's a senior system engineer at Systematic, one of Denmark's largest IT companies. And he says, my biggest benefits must be that today I feel really good about working with secure software. Among other things, I have become much stronger in asking the right questions about IT security for a project. And I know how to find the right knowledge. If I encounter problems, I do not know. I dare say that Systematic gained 120% from the fact that I took the secure software construction course. I draw on my knowledge from the course every single day, both when working on projects that specifically relate to security components and when it comes to very common projects where security should be a part of the general risk analysis for a project. So thank you very much for the award. The award is very important and highly appreciated recognition, which will help us even more to gain more visibility and hopefully many more students. And I really look forward to tell my colleagues and students the great news. Thank you. Thank you, Bettina, for your uh, presentation and congratulations for your prize. Okay, and uh, I, I don't know, I think if there is, uh, we could take some questions if there is somebody that want to know more, I guess. Yeah, actually I do have a question uh, while reading also your uh, uh, proposal, I was uh, wondering, uh, um, so I, I noticed that you have uh, a large number of uh, uh, students and you also mentioned that, that not the, not all of them uh, take the whole program uh, they can take part of it do you have uh, do you provide the guidance uh, to these uh, um, to your students uh, to and suggestions on which part is uh, best suited for their uh, for their given their initial skill and also, uh, what is the typical uh, starting uh, point in terms of skills that they have, that the average student has when, uh, or if this is possible, maybe there is a la very large variety of uh, ingress, let's say, skills in your case. Yeah. To ask the first question first, yes, we do have uh, guidance. We both have guidance across the three universities, helping them to choose uh, subjects. But we also supply guidance within uh, the, the, the institutes who are providing courses. So we have a lot of guidance for the students, uh, also on our website for, for the education. And the other question, yes, it is very different what background they come with. For example, when they read um, uh, software construction, they can either come from a, a professional bachelor degree and uh, they come both from the IT communities, uh, the IT businesses and, and, and other businesses. And then you have on, on the end the software construction um, uh, people and on the other hand you have uh, managers within IT. So they have very different background. So we guide them uh, if, if they need it. But most of our students, um, they know often what knowledge they want and they pick the courses where the knowledge is that they want. Either they want themselves or they need in their business. Many of them have this uh, dialogue with their managers on what to choose as well. Yes. Does that I answer the question? I have a clarification question, if you allow. Yes. Um, what is the uh, admission prerequisites? Yeah. Um, for, for this? Do they need a, a bachelor's degree or does the professional education suffice? The, the admission requirements are different uh, regarding what you uh, are, are studying. So if you're studying on our software construction, you have a bachelor degree within software construction to read those subjects. On our other specialization, we have other admissions requirements, but the minimum admission requirements is that you have a bachelor degree Mm -hmm. and you have at least two years of work experience within the field that you're studying. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a 60 credit program for getting the masters. Yeah, it is. 
Okay, thanks. Okay. Is uh, there any more question? Maybe a, a question which is probably, let's say, classical in this period. Uh, do you have, uh, uh, I, I guess, you, you, do you have online lectures? Uh, were they part of uh, your uh, master or uh, um, are they becoming part of, uh, of it? Or uh, you, you do have any presence? How do you organize your uh, classes in that respect? 90% or 95% of our classes, you, you have physical meetings. We do not have much online. We've had a lot of dialogues with our students and their demands are very different. For example, Henrik is, is, is testing some of the online at the moment because some of our students in, within the software construction area prefer online uh, teaching. But in our organization specialization, they prefer to be there physically. So they, they don't like online education. So we're, we're trying to, to, um, to make our education the way that our students like it. So we are adapting. But we have tested online teaching for many years, but not much. And we don't have that uh, uh, great experience about it. They like to meet because they like to talk to each other. They like to learn from each other when they meet. And they find that very difficult uh, when they're online. But yep. COVID might change this. <laughs> it is changing. It is changing a lot of stuff. So I'll see what happened in a few years. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. No, thanks. Uh, okay. So I don't see any further requests for, uh, for a question. Uh, so once again, uh, congratulations to, to Bettina for the prize and many thanks to the award committee for having worked uh, for, for, for us. And now we can go to introduce the next uh, prize, which is uh, the Minerva Informatics Equality Award sponsored by Google, which as uh, the, the, the title says, um, focused on uh, improving equality in uh, informatics education. This is the, the, the fifth year of the prize and the, the, this year the chair of the award committee uh, is uh, Gordana Dodikovic. Sorry if I didn't pronounce well your family name. And Gordana, uh, so the floor is yours to introduce the prize. Thank you very much Enrico. You're welcome. Um, it was a real pleasure to work uh, with the award committee in this year's Minerva Informatics Equality Award. As you can see behind me, I have Minerva and her all uh, symbolizing wisdom and uh, female uh, strength. So uh, we were working really very uh, nicely in this committee and uh, we, uh, we were united uh, behind the decision. We have got a lot of great uh, help uh, from uh, Letizia and uh, Christina, uh, but the, the, the main work is in, in the award committee, which consisted of Ivona Brandic from uh, Technical University Wien, uh, Silvia Ilieva from Sofia University, Dimpna O'Sullivan from Technical University Dublin, uh, Olof Uwe uh, from University of Oslo, Alexander Serebrenik from Eindhoven University of Technology. So it was a great work and as I said, we were united behind the decision. So please, the next slide will uh, show our choice, our, our winner. We have one winner and uh, I'm happy to be able to present Informatics Europe 2020 Minerva Informatics Equality Award, which will be presented to Department of Computer Science, University College of London, in recognition of outstanding support for the transition of female PhD and postdoctoral researchers into faculty positions. So congratulations, and the next slide will show your prize. Thank you, Gondana. And again, also from the Informatics Europe office, um, a big congratulations for the award. As you can see, um, we have an award plaque for you as well. 
and we will send this plate to you um, after the conference in due time. I would like to hand over now the word to e Dr. Ivana Drobniak to tell us more about their initiative. And I hope that Ivana is already with us. Um, as far as I can see, she should be here. And Ivana, I also allowed you to control the screen. So if you would like, you can also accept this and take over the slides. That would be great. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Um, so do I? Um, yes. How do I start the presentation? Do I? Uh, you just, uh, the presentation is already going, your slides are included and you can just continue with the next slide and then we should already see your presentation. Um, let me just see. So, oh, okay, thank you so much. <laughs> well, yes, perfect. So, so my name is uh, Ivana Drobniak uh, and I'm an associate professor representing computer science department from the University College London. Um, and I would first like to thank the committee for giving us uh, this uh, award. It's a really, really big honor and um, it's a really big incentive for us to continue doing further work um, on gender equality. Um, so we worked hard to, on promoting gender balance in our department. And I think in this talk, I'll present some of the activities we made. So we are a really large department. Um, we have over 200 academic and research staff and over a thousand students. We have very strong interdisciplinary research and um, we, have, we were top in the UK in the 2014 Research Excellence Framework. 96% um, of our research uh, is rated internationally excellent. Uh, we are also very strong in teaching and uh, really um, have strong emphasis on innovation, especially in bringing a research and rich teaching program. Um, finally, um, we do have and put lots of emphasis in work around our equality and diversity, especially here I will show activities we have for addressing the gender balance. So we have a whole kind of very elaborate structure uh, for this. Uh, we've been working on this for the last 10 years. So we've kind of structured ourselves around five different A's, which is the first one is ARRIVE, where we develop affinity for computer science in young girls aged from nine to 18. Um, Aspire creates dreams. So we showcase the female role models in computer science. Um, then in Achieve activities, we develop the skills for the students and for our junior staff to achieve their full potential. Um, in advanced activities, we create pathways for career progression. And finally, in Amplify, we share best practices nationally and inter internationally. So our whole committee is sort of divided to address all of these different um, uh, areas of our strategy. Um, so here, um, so we were very lucky and we were awarded um, for our strategy several times over the last 10 years. So we got the bronze award and two silver awards from uh, the Athena Swan UK Charter for Gender Equality in 2013, 15 and 2020. And uh, we were also awarded the first ever Minerva Award. Thank you very much for that. It was in 2016 for advancing the careers of female faculty. And this year we were awarded for supporting careers of our PhD students and our postdoctoral researchers. So in, those, in this talk, I will focus on the activities that um, are for that purpose. So regardless um, of, of where we are in the world, I think for us academics, um, we all share a somewhat similar experience in that the academic path is a little bit like climbing a Mount Everest. I hope you all agree with that. Um, so there are a number of different stations and um, to reach on that path, uh, going from being an undergraduate student to becoming a professor. And so they're all equally important, but I guess, the, uh, and they all have their own challenges. However, probably the hardest one of all is the transition from the post of a PhD student and a postdoctoral researcher to a permanent faculty position. So uh, we've 
uh, looked at this whole path line. We've looked at the percentages of females and males on that path. And we tried to investigate whether this transition uh, affects more uh, men or women. Um, and so you can see in this graph, we mapped up all the different stages. And what we found is that the women suffered more than men in this transition period, with average percentage of females dropping by more than 10%. Um, uh, from the 23% that are in the ranks of students and postdocs to 11% that are amongst the faculty. What we also found is that, um, because we looked at, I apologize, so we looked at for some of the reasons for this difference and what we found, which is quite interesting, is that the age when this transition happens is early to late 30s, which is a time when most women nowadays start having families. So there are lots of different challenges in that period of a woman's life and you know some of these are you know child care responsibilities work-life balance um no perspective of stability which is sometimes the um what uh, how it feels in academia uh to many and possibly an atmosphere which does not easily accommodate for family planning so hence to address these challenges what we have created are some additional steps in that transitional period um, and for these steps, we've included also plenty of support. So, first of all, we uh, uh, encourage and support our postdocs and our PhD students to apply for external independent fellowships, such as Liverpool Trust or EPSSCs or Marie Curie. Um, we created for that purpose a specialized workshop series and that train the students and the staff of how to get the fellowships. We provide help with preparing applications. They are very hands-on. Um, we do frequent follow-ups and prepare them both for applications and for interviews. And we always have very successful uh, fellows and faculty members present in these uh, workshop series. And secondly, we've also created a special scheme, which then um, chooses the most um, academically gifted from these fellows um, and uh, offers them a position of proleptic lecture. So this uh, position was created at that kind of intermediate step. And it's a position which uh, automatically uh, becomes an assistant professor position once the fellowship has ended. So this scheme is open to both men and women. However, we find that women especially opt for it because um, of the uh, feeling of stability that this proletic leadership comes with. And the scheme itself, although it started in 2012, and very soon, very soon, like uh, two or three years after it started, we could see uh, a strong impact it was starting to make in the percentage of our female faculty. Uh, we've also created a new promotion model. So before 2014, the staff used to put themselves forward for promotion. However, we found that uh, lots of our female uh, uh, members of staff tend to wait longer. So they would try to uh, wait until they feel they are ready for promotion while men on average uh, uh, waited less. Uh, so we, in 2014, introduced the motion, promotion model in which every member of staff is automatically considered for promotion every year. So their CVs are evaluated and then they get the feedback uh, every year. So this new promotion model benefited both men and women and increased the percentage of both. However, it impacted uh, much more the, the women percentages, so uh, which rose from 8% to 28% of eligible women. And now the both men and, and women uh, percentage of promotion are equal. Um, so fourthly, we've also worked to provide very good family support. We uh, introduced a special research award, which was uh, automatically awarded to the staff that comes back uh, from maternity leave. So this is 10,000 pounds that can be spent for any type of research that the staff needs in order to speed them up with their research. We uh, also have emergency childcare. So when you need to attend conference or meeting, we award this very quickly um, to um, male or female members of our staff. We have a nursery on site, and in our meetings, we uh, uh, 
uh, our meetings are often attended by babies. I mean, numerous occasions I brought my children to work and they were being looked after by students or just with me in the meeting. We also encourage flexible and homeworking and we schedule our seminars and meetings in the core work times between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. Uh, also, very, very important point which we try to encourage is that our leading figures, especially our head of the department, they kind of always there to provide encouragement and they give personal examples for work life balance. And I feel this is invaluable to other members, more junior members of staff. Uh, fifthly, we, oh, apologies, there is a Another one here. So fifthly, organize social events for women in computer science. Um, and we are aware that many different organizations organize social events. And but what we've done that is kind of special for ours is that we make sure that the invitations are personal. Um, that goes a long way and makes a big difference for them being, rather than being sent like from auto-generated emails or from a, the secretary. Um, we also, um, all of our uh, leading faculty female members are present. Um, and this is also quite invaluable for our younger members of staff who, uh, so that the mix between the postdocs, the PhD students and the very senior professors, it's all happening there Why we are celebrating successes, both work and personal, where we introduce new members and we have fun. Uh, we also invite uh, uh, external prominent female role models. For example, we once invited a very famous American scientist, uh, computer scientist Maya Matarich, who was a winner of the Anita Borg Award and the Presidential Award for Mentoring in STEM, uh, just for tea. And she came. And that was um, really wonderful. Um, we also showcase our female role models. So in addition to the socials, uh, they are visible in our websites, in our uh, lecture theatres and in our newsletters. And finally, our Equality and Diversity Chair sits on all of our leading decision-making meetings in the department. So this includes the Leadership and Promotion Committee. So that way we are able to uh, challenge biases that sometimes present in choices that are based on old models or opinions. So this all led to a very kind of steady increase uh, in the percent of our female faculty. So from 11% in 2010, when we just started, to 21% in 2018. So this is 8% um, higher than the Russell Group University's average. Um, and we are very proud of this achievement. So if you remember I showed some data from 2010 and we're looking back at that data and when we compare the data that we have in 2018, we can see that, apologies, we can see that there's a very big gap. There's a, all of the different paths on our, on the academic path have an increased female percentage number. Uh, however, uh, what is really important is that gap between the PhD position and a postdoc position and the faculty position has greatly reduced. I will switch back between these two slides just a few times so that you can see the, how, what is the considerable impact that our actions have made. Um, so I think that this success and the impact that we made wouldn't have been possible just by these activities. I think it is really important and I will here show just the three essential ingredients that we had to support uh, what we have done. So the first one was that we had a top-down motivation like from the government, from the higher body. So in our case, um, this is the Athena Swan Charter. So the Athena Swan Charter provided a structural framework for all of this uh, development, and it made an impact across the whole of UK for many other universities in the UK. So the second one is that uh, we've had the really dedicated and really personally invested leaders. So our two heads of the department, Steve and John, sat on almost all committee meetings and our leading female professors came to even the smallest of social events. I mean, that was um, absolutely invaluable. And finally, um, we had the most dedicated, brilliant committee over the last 10 years. 
with representatives from the whole academic path line um, and with strong support from the professional services team. I think without all of them, I think this award would not be possible. And I would like to thank all of them. And I would like to thank you for this honor. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ivana, for your presentation. And thanks for your very, very good project. I mean, the, the number you have shown this uh, almost doubling of the percentage of female participation is uh, uh, almost unbelievable. I mean, but we, we believe because it's there. <laughs> and, and no, and it's clearly a, a, a proof that things can be done requires time because you, it took 10 years for you to do this. So it, it requires time. So we have to trust in, in the fact that uh, uh, the, the strategy is good and the direction is good and it requires commitment from the highest level of, uh, of the organization. Otherwise it will, it will not happen, but it can be done. So this is a very good example and we are happy to have recognized it, it uh, giving you the, the award. Uh, um, so I, I will now leave the floor to question, uh, if there is any. I have a question, uh, and that is about how much more work do you need if you yearly evaluate everybody for promotion? Yes, that's a, uh, it's a very challenging thing to do. Um, and uh, we have, because we, in, in our department, we have a very strong appraisal process. So we, in preparation for submitting a CV for promotion committee, we have a step of appraisal where each member of the staff discusses their CV with the senior member of the faculty. And in that process already, the senior member of the faculty is aware of the person and aware of all the characteristics. So when the kind of promotion committee happens, the senior members of the faculty are able to sometimes summarize or sometimes emphasize some of the key points. Um, we also sometimes, this committee is divided into smaller groups and each different group looks at a different a number of the CVs. Um, so we use um, a range of different strategies for that. But it is something that we constantly have to reevaluate because our professors are full of lots of different responsibilities and um, going into the details of every CV is quite challenging. So usually it is one or two characteristics that are kind of important and essential for a person to have as a feedback uh, rather than you know, feedback that is broken down for every single element um, of the CV. But usually that one or two characteristics are usually sufficient for the person to work, continue further. Thank you, Ivan. Okay. Um, is there any more remark or question? There are Lin Linda. questions in the chat. Uh, yes, so, I mean, it's really amazing what your department has done. Uh, I'm very, very impressed and really happy that a department has done all this, but I can imagine it's very daunting for a department that hasn't taken on any of these actions or activities yet. Where should we start? What's the first thing we should do in order to get some sort of initial gains to make us more uh, responsive and you know, receptive to the other actions that we could take? Um, thank you. It's, it's a really, really good question. I think probably the one of the most fundamental questions. Uh, so we were very lucky with that because we had the Athena Swan Equality Charter. And I think that top down in motivation from the government and having something set up that is higher than the university uh, itself makes it much easier. Um, so the Athena Swan Charter kind of works for all of the universities across the UK and uh, they encourage departments to apply for awards. And what's really important is that now even the funding bodies in the UK require departments and universities to have at least a bronze award. So that kind of in a way like uh, the funding and the money sources are now very connected to this uh, framework. 
So those two are very strong incentives. So we were lucky to have them. And so we were then, then it was possible for us. And then the department and university has an incentive to invest in these committees. Then the leaders become much more invested. Um, and so by the time it comes to the committee, then all those motivated people, you know, there's a kind of path that there is to follow. So it is easier. So I would recommend for, for, for you who maybe to maybe look and work together in trying to find a more um, wider initiatives that to join wider initiatives or to have universities commit to wider initiatives in parallel to the work that you can do as kind of just on the ground, the committee itself. I think that both approaches, top and bottom, are extremely important. And for example, Minerva Informatics Award is really important. It's really great to be able to just share these experiences um, because then um, it's just another way of showing that it's very important to have that top-down support. Uh, to go also like the committee that there is at the moment, the European one for gender and quality. I think those are all very good initiatives that need to happen for this just to be embraced by the society. Okay. So I think we are now to the end of this session. So thanks again to, and congratulations to, to Ivana and uh, to UCL for, for the prize. And uh, thanks to the entire uh, award committee for uh, having uh, worked for us in identifying the, the awardee. And um, before going to the break, uh, there should be, okay, please remember that um, we have also a page whose link is in the, in the chat box, a page with the member spotlights where we have put the information from uh, our members that uh, uh, want to, 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 to point to various uh, initiatives that they are organizing all, all around Europe. And um, so have a look at this page whose who links you, you, you find there. And then we meet again at uh, three o'clock for the uh, Informatic Europe se special session, which will be actually two, two sessions. The first one, dialogue with members. So we will be speaking with you, our members, but not only members are invited. I mean, this is a, an, open, uh, an open session and please come. Maybe you will become a member after having seen how interesting our, uh, our, our activities. And the, the second part of this session, so the, the second session, uh, the final one of this afternoon will be the general assembly where we will take some, uh, the formal decision we, we take in, in every assembly. So have a, have a nice coffee break and uh, see you again at three o'clock sharp. Thank you.